morning, everyone. I'm Jim Holt, uh, one of the adult Sunday school teachers here at Calvary Baptist Church. And uh, it's morning here where I am uh, recording this, um, but if it's afternoon where you are when you're listening to this, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you as we study uh, from God's Word. Uh, we are going to be in Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 16 through 31. So if you have your Bible and or want to get it out, go ahead and get that out. Turn to Luke, the fourth chapter. We'll start with verse 16 and we'll go through verse 31. We're not going to read the whole scripture to start with, but we'll read all of those scriptures before we get done with the lesson. Um, we are studying out of the uh, material called the Gospel Project. It looks like this. If you have the student material, you might want to get that book. I'll be referring to it from time to time. So, um, welcome once again, and I'm pleased to be with you. Looking forward to uh, helping you uh, study God's Word. So let's have a short word of prayer as we begin this so that we can invite the Holy Spirit in to guide us through our study. Heavenly Father, thank you for a chance to be in your house this morning where we're recording. And for those who are watching from wherever they're watching or listening, Lord, I pray for them in their lives as we enter this study that you would fill them with the knowledge they need to have and the inspiration that comes from your word and the insight that they need to help them become more like you. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity, for the facilities that you've given us so that we can do these kinds of things. Thank you for your word continuing throughout the world. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, as Luke is wont to do whenever he's setting the scene, he talks about where things are and the time periods involved. Um, the previous week's lesson, if you're following along in the Gospel Project, um, they were in Capernaum. This is an area in Israel um, or Palestine at the time where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. Um, he did a lot of teaching there. Some of many of his sermons, a lot of the uh, miracles that he performed happened in Capernaum. And Luke centers a lot of his writings around those things. Uh, today's lesson, we're going to be in a synagogue. Uh, in the hometown, uh, Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. Now, we know he was born in Bethlehem, but grew up in Nazareth in the carpenter shop that his dad had there. Uh, what he was doing at this particular time was revealing his mission to his followers. Uh, most of the disciples, uh, most of the writing that we have in the Gospels is Jesus talking to and leading and developing the, the people that the disciples were going to become and helping them understand why he was here and what their responsibility was going to be when he left. So, um, at this time in history, at this point in history, um, the Jewish people were ready and hopeful for a deliverer, whom they called a Messiah. Now, the deliverer they were hoping for was some kind of conquering king, kind of a David person, somebody who would defeat all their enemies and reestablish Israel as a um, major power in this world. So Jesus was coming and he had to deal with that since he was the Messiah and he had to deal with that misperception that these Hebrew people generally had. Um, there was the earthly kingdom that they were hoping for and wanting, and there was the heavenly kingdom that Jesus actually came to establish. So, uh, where is the focus in, in a worship service? When we're having a worship service, where do we focus our attention? Uh, kind of depends on where we are in the worship service. Usually it starts out with announcements and whoever's making the announcements, the pastor or uh, the worship leader, whoever it is that makes announcements. Um, we kind of focus on that, and then it may switch to the music part, the worship part, often we call it, of the service. There may be spatial music, there may be worship leaders, there may be just hymn singing, um, there may be a guitar or a, an organ or a, a piano or, or all of the above. And so our attention focuses on 
that uh, when that's happening in our service. Um, but most of the time, and, and almost always, the focal point of our worship together is the sermon uh, delivered by the pastor based on his inspiration from the week months before and his preparation for delivering uh, the word that the Holy Spirit has led him to deliver that morning or evening, afternoon, whenever it is that he, he prepares his sermon and delivers it. Um, so Jesus makes a declaration here in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth um, talking about where he is and um, so in Luke 4, 16 through 22, we're going to read these words. And I'm going to read out of the quarterly, so if you're following that, you can, you can read it uh, more readily that way. And here's what it says, verse 16 of chapter 4 of Luke. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet was, Isaiah was given him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled the scroll, rolled up the scroll, and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? A lot to unpack in, these, uh, in this part of the scripture. Um, imagine the Jewish people with all their expectations of a deliverer assembling in church, or maybe imagine yourself being there, and here a local boy, a carpenter's son, you know, it could have been a, a plumber's son, or it could have been a, a farmer's son, or, you know, a Pharisee's son. Didn't matter. They were expecting some huge hero to come and fulfill the Messiah prophecy. And Jesus reads this prophet, this passage from Isaiah. Now, the scrolls that he was handed were the Isaiah scrolls. So it wasn't like he could have read out of, uh, you know, Deuteronomy or Genesis, because he, he wasn't handed those. He was handed the Isaiah scrolls according to God's plan. And, and because Jesus was God fully, um, he kind of knew in advance that's where he would be getting it. And he knew that this was the right time to begin revealing that he was, in fact, the Messiah, the expected one, of Israel. Now the problem with that, of course, is there's a shocker. Here's, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me get this right. One of our local boys is going to be the Messiah, is going to be the next David to deliver us out of the oppression of the mighty Romans. You know, that just doesn't add up. I don't, I don't know how that's going to work. So that was a shocker. Um, but it was true and it was accurate the things that he said about himself. Um, but even though it's true and accurate, as we're finding out in this time of lots of information out there, it's not what people wanted to hear. You know, wait a minute, that doesn't fit my view, that doesn't fit what I have in mind. Well, how unlikely is it that Jesus could fill all of these scripture references, all these things, um, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to uh, proclaim liberty to the captives, to recovering of sight to blind, set at liberty those who oppressed, and proclaim the Lord's favor, and all the other prophecies that he fit. One mathematician did some math on this, and he said it's very unlikely that by chance somebody could have fulfilled all the prophecies from the Old Testament. In fact, he did a little math on it, and he says the chance is... 1 in 10 to the 17th power that this would actually happen. So from human standpoint, the likelihood is very, very, very small. Almost impossible.
But from God's perspective, it was exactly what needed to happen at exactly the time it needed to happen. Um, in fact, to carry this, this little illustration further, um, he says uh, that um, if, you, if you took the, um, took the, uh, pro the possibility, here it is, uh, so now Mark, uh, suppose we take 10 to the 17th silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state two feet deep. Now mark one of those silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up the one silver dollar and say this is the right one. The chances of him being able to get the right one are 10 to the 17th power. That's how unlikely it was from a human standpoint for Jesus to succeed. So. Um, unlikely that Jesus could uh, fulfill these unless he was actually the true Messiah, which he was. Um, um, there are some interesting things that uh, Jesus left out of his reading of Elisha and Elijah out of, the, out of the reading that he was giving. One is that Jesus emphasizes the prophets of Israel had rejected had been rejected in their own country. In fact, he points out that during a famine, Elijah was sent not to the widows of Israel, but to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon, a Gentile person. And then Elisha was sent not to the many Israelite beggar, lepers, but instead only Naaman, who was a, a Syrian Gentile. So. Jesus was pointing out that um, the Israelites, the Jewish people, had kind of lost their mission. And so that God had sent him to not only uh, speak to the Israelites, but to the Gentiles since the Israelites were isolating themselves from the Gentiles and didn't understand that part of their mission was to help everybody become a good Jew, if you will, uh, or in a relationship with God like the Jews' covenant was. But now, Jesus was bringing a new covenant. <clears throat> uh, if you're following along in the student quarterly, you'll find that there is uh, a part of the uh, quarterly that has some fill-in-the-blank parts. And this is the word, the world opposed to God. So here's how it reads. In many instances in Scripture, the term world refers to an active and evil spiritual force that is in direct conflict with God and His kingdom. So, kingdom is the first blank, uh, word in blank. And then, the second sentence, the evil world force operates under, here's the blank, Satan's control, so Satan in that blank, displaying the same self-centeredness and deceit that is found within his character. Then the final sentence in blank, Christians are called to overcome this world by, of spiritual evil by, here's the word that goes in the blank, faith in the Son of God. So kind of a changing of the whole aspect here of instead of Jews being the promised ones to deliver the message to the whole world, now it was... Jesus coming to deliver the message directly to those who would become the carriers of the message to the whole world. And, and thankfully, his disciples got it from their exposure to him and, and further development by the Spirit that they were not to go just to Jewish people, but also to the Gentile people. So, um, Jesus then went ahead and predicted uh, his rejection in Luke 4, 23 through 27. So let's look at that uh, in the scripture, 20, Luke 24 through 27. 23 through 27 says, And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me to, to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. 
What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say unto you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in that truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came all over the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, a Gentile woman, you remember, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile. So these are the references that Jesus gave him, saying, I know that I'm not acceptable to you. I know that I'll be rejected. But in effect, God has rejected you that are criticizing me because you have not kept the covenant that God made with you. You have rejected the covenant. So, um, what are we going to do? Uh, what promises of God do we struggle to accept from which Jesus has set us free? What are some of the struggles that we get anxious about, or maybe worried about, or concerned about. So right now, we can say health is a worry. You know, what's going to happen with this disease spreading around the world, this COVID-19 disease? Will we ever be able to conquer it? Is it going to be with us forever, like malaria or some other diseases we haven't fully conquered? Uh, what about financial want? Some of us have had uh, jobs that are no longer that we can no longer go to. We're getting maybe some supplemental help. We're doing things that we can do to earn some funds, but our financial future is certainly not assured right now because of the workplace losses that have happened. What about safety? You know, are we safe in our homes? Some people are in a domestic abuse situation and having to be home all day with the abuser has removed whatever safety they might have had. Uh, how about acceptance? You know, we worry about, will I be acceptable? Do I have the right look? Do I have the right clothes, house, car, whatever it is? Will I be accepted by my peers and by others that I'm around, or will I be rejected? There are many other concerns and worries that we have from time to time for our children, for our parents, for relatives, lots of concerns. Jesus came to not take those away completely, but to set us free from them being our major concern. Part of Jesus' message was that by rejecting him, the Jews were missing the blessing of carrying his message to the Gentiles. So as we said, Elijah ministered to a Gentile widow and Elisha to a Gentile leper. Um, to whom is the church today called to minister? that we may be missing. Are there poor folks that just never come to your church, that never come to our church, or never come to our... We just aren't somewhere where we ever run across poor people, so poor that they wonder about food and shelter. Um, people who do not follow our customs, maybe from other countries, maybe from other parts of this country, maybe from other cultures. And they don't know our customs, and they are not familiar with them, and they feel uncomfortable trying to fit into our customs. Um, are there people who look differently than we do? Maybe they're not a man, they're a woman, or they're not a woman, they're a man. Or they're not a teenager, they're a child, or they're not young anymore, they're old. What, whatever those things are that kind of separate us into categories, are those that we are ignoring in our ministry? Maybe we need to open up our thinking, open up our worldview, and see who's out there in our community that we need to be ministering to. Jesus pointed out, God loves everybody, and he sent Jesus to minister to everybody. Jesus' knowledge of rejection and even experiencing it did not deter him on his mission. So let's look at our last passage here, Luke 28 through 31, 4, 28 through 31. Um, here we go. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built, so that they would throw him down the cliff. But passing through the midst, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. 
Jesus, they rejected him. They were going to do away with him. They were angry at him for trying to pretend that he was the Savior of Messiah. They were going to put him to an end. Jesus knew that he was going to come to an end, but this wasn't the time. He wasn't yet ready. And so he just went through their midst. I think, it doesn't tell us here, but there's speculation that he just disappeared from among them without them knowing why. It could have been they were temporarily blinded to his presence. It could have been that he just, by force of his will, moved through the crowd and nobody stopped him. We don't know the details, but we know that they wanted to kill him. Um, Jesus was rejected. He could have given up. He could have said, gosh, not even in my hometown do people love me. Um, there were a couple of scientists in Detroit um, years ago that uh, were working on developing a formula for something that um, they could use to cut grease and clean bacteria and um, trying to, to take care of some kind of top-notch cleaner. And they began experimenting with the formula. And they, and they, they did 10 different formulas and none of them worked. And then they did 50 different formulas and none of them worked. And they did 100 different formulas none of them worked. They did 400 different formulas and they didn't work. They did 408 formulas and they didn't work. But they didn't give up. So they developed Formula 409. Some of you, many of you may have used Formula 409 as a cleanser a, um, a, around the home to, to make things better and to cut grease and to make good cleaning done. Um, but that's a that's what happens when you don't give up, when you push through, when you do what you're called to do. So does Jesus offer any comfort to today's witnesses? Well, his perseverance is an example of how God will work out his plan through his children, through humans. Jesus was a human form, uh, in spite of whatever opposition might be out there. Our God is the Holy Spirit, and he promises to never leave us alone. Uh, the missing words from the blanks on page 109 of your project, of your gospel project, if you have that, um, would be as follows. Um, kingdom, Satan, and faith. I think I gave you those before, and I didn't give you the right ones for the previous ones, which were um, page 107, which are completes, outside, and eternity. So I got those out of order, but um, it's, it's up to us to carry out God's Word. Um, the opposition is real, but maybe not as physical as we often think. If we think of Ephesians 2, 2 John 4, 30, and uh, 1 John 5, 4, we'll know that we fight against spirits and things unseen, not just this world and the discouragement that we get here, but things like demons and spiritual things that are against us. Fortunately, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, which is where all the demons are, and we can overcome them with the power of the Holy Spirit following God's guidance. Um, that's pretty much the end of the lesson. Hopefully you got through that with me okay and enjoyed uh, learning more about how Jesus was able to persevere in spite of being rejected by his own people in his own hometown and probably even his own family. Um, what I'd like to do now is take a moment to pray for you. Uh, maybe you have some prayer requests and things that are going on in your life that you'd like to pray for. I don't know what they are and I won't be able to hear you uh, if you speak them. But if you'll think them or speak them or write them down now in the next 20 seconds, I will, uh, at the end of that 20 seconds, I'll begin praying for your requests and your well-being. So let's take about 20 seconds to do that, starting now. you've had time to think of or, or word some of those prayer requests, let me pray with you now. Heavenly Father, thank you for those who are listening to this message whenever they are listening to it. 
Lord, I just pray a blessing on their life for being um, faithful to study your word and to try to seek out knowledge about how you would have us minister to those in our community, those who are unlike us, those who maybe oppose us. Lord, I thank you for your word, that we can trust it, that it gives us direction and guidance. Lord, I just pray now that you would be with us as we go through this week. Be with those requests that were made by those who are watching this, uh, whether it's for health or assurance or concerns that they have for loved ones. Um, Lord, for health care workers, whoever their requests are, Lord, I just pray that you would honor those and answer them in a way that's pleasing to you, that would give you glory. Lord, I pray for our those who are ill, those who are suffering from this disease that's taking the world right now, other diseases that have been long-standing, other maladies in their lives, weaknesses, challenges. Lord, I pray for uh, health for them. I pray for those who have been affected financially by all the layoffs and the closings. I just pray especially <clears throat> that you would help them get through this time and recover well uh, in the days to come. Lord, I pray for good uh, knowledge and good foresight about when to uh, venture out and uh, the right level of risk to take as things unfold and that each of us will know how to do that in a way that's safe for ourselves and for others. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for our leaders as they try to provide ways and information that will help us with those decisions. I pray that you would, they would seek your guidance and your wisdom. Lord, I pray for our church now, Lord, as we begin to look at the opportunities to open back up, that we would do it in a way that provides um, people with the ability to stay protected uh, and yet gather together in a reasonable way. Uh, be with our pastor and those that lead our church. Lord, give them wisdom and strength. Help them to know how to minister as well as to share the word. All these things, Lord, I ask in your name. Amen.